Good morning, good morning, good morning. I'm Pastor Tony. If you're new with us, welcome to Life Spring today. Hey, um, Sylvia and I just got back from the S2 conference in Arizona. S2 is our, uh, we don't really have a denomination, it's an association of churches, but it's our association's kind of annual uh, training meeting for pastors. It was actually usually just our denomination, our group of churches, but this year, S2, we, it was always in Chandler, Arizona, and there's, two, there's a couple good things about Arizona. Number one, you go to Arizona, and it makes you feel better about the heat in California, okay? So that's one good thing about Arizona. The other good thing is the S2 conference. It was amazing. It was fantastic. We, we are uh, the premier church starting movement in the United States, our the association that we're part of, and I'm talking, we're like 1,500, 1,600 churches. I don't know how many we are in the U.S. right now, but, but like maybe 1,800, 2,000 churches by now. But we set a goal in 2020 to start four, over 400 churches, 435 churches, and, we, and we've got another year to go, and we are like eight churches short of this goal of 435. So we've started over 400 churches in four years. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And you guys have been a part of starting five of those churches. That's amazing. That's fantastic. We should give ourselves a hand. You should give yourself a hand. Um, so, but, so we went, S2 was normally one conference in Arizona, and now they split it up. There's a West Coast conference in Chandler, Arizona. There's an East Coast conference in Indianapolis that's going to happen in a few weeks. And, and, you know, it's amazing to me. We are the premier church starting movement in the United States. But Sylvia and I had to travel 450 miles to the West Coast conference. And the East Coast Conference is in Indianapolis. And the last time I checked, Indianapolis was in the Midwest. We're great at starting churches. Geography, not so well. Not so good. But anyway, it was just a fantastic time. We had a great time. Met up with a bunch of our church planters and got to talk with them and see how they're doing. Uh, met with a bunch of our pastors that we've known for 30 years. It was just really a great time. Then we come back and we went bowling last night. 20 people uh, went bowling last night. It was amazing. Uh, you know, and, and Paul Simborski gets all these props for throwing strikes right, for bowling strikes. Well, when we had our church softball team, and I would get up to bat, and I would strike out, nobody said anything to me. <laughs> it's just not fair. Hey, today, um, I want to welcome you to Biology 101, okay? We're talking about caterpillars and butterflies. So let me ask you some questions. It's a pop quiz. I know. Where do caterpillars live? Where do they live? Anybody know? Milkweed plant, right? A milkweed plant. That's, that's where they live. Most of the time, they spend their entire lives on the same milkweed plant they were born on. How about butterflies? Where do butterflies live? Everywhere, right? I mean, they just fly all over the place, flying to a different plant about, on average, every three minutes. Every three minutes, they say. How far do caterpillars travel? Yeah, I mean, no more than 10 feet, but usually like three, four feet. They travel up and down their plant, you know, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you know, over the course of their life. What about uh, butterflies? Hundreds of miles, actually even thousands of miles. Monarchs make an annual 3,000-mile migration from Canada down to Mexico every year. What do caterpillars eat? Milkweed plant. Yeah, they got tiny little mouths with little rows of teeth, and they eat, they eat the, pretty much the plant they were born on. How about butterflies? Nectar. Yeah, exactly. They suck the nectar from thousands of different flowers. What do caterpillars look like? Little grubby worms, right? <laughs> yeah, isn't that pretty? Don't you like to see those in your house? Uh, what about, uh, what, do, what do butterflies look like? Beautiful, graceful, right? Which would you rather be? The ugly worm 
or the graceful butterfly. <laughs> I'll tell you what, because of Jesus Christ, you either are if you've accepted his offer or can be, if you're still on the fence, a completely different person. You can be. We're continuing this morning in our series called Count Your Blessings. Um, we can't change the world around us. You've probably noticed that. We can't change the world around us, but we can allow God to change us by his power and his grace. Right? We're continuing through the book of Colossians in the New Testament. We're in chapter 3 today. But before we get there, let's stand together. We're going to read 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's going to be up on the screen behind me. 2 Corinthians 5.17 in the English Standard Version. Read it with me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, everything I'm sorry, the new has come. I still know it in other translations. <laughs> the new has come. Let's pray and see what God wants to teach us today. Father, take your word in whatever translation we remember it in, and I just pray that you would burn it into our lives. You would help us to see through a new set of eyes who we are in this world and what you have called us to be, what you've called us to do, what you've called us to live like in this world. We ask it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Go ahead and have a seat this morning. That's an amazing statement when you think about it. You are in Christ. You are a new creation. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Your old life is over. Whatever it was, your old life is over. Everything has become new. Everything has become new. We were little worms who woke up one day with wings. We were ugly maggots grubbing around, crawling on a plant, eating whatever was in front of us and scaring little girls when suddenly we were clothed in beauty and grace. The world became our playground and the sweetest nectars became our food. Does this happen simply because you adopt a new philosophy? No, no happen simply because you believe some new principle? No. No way. Obviously, there is more to being in Christ than adopting some new philosophy or, or religion. Being in Christ must somehow involve some deeper transformation. And in chapter 3 of the book of Colossians, the apostle Paul gives us a guided tour of this metamorphosis that is ours. If you're joining us, there is a note-taking outline. It's in the back. If you didn't, hand one, didn't get handed one when you came in, you can get it. Or you can scan that QR code in front of you and pull it up on the app, website. You can follow along at home or here in the room. But in chapter 3, he gives us this guided tour. Let's take a look. He starts off here in, in chapter, one, or chapter 3, verse 1. And he says, if then you have been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on this earth, for you have died to the things of this earth, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let's break this down. The word if in our English language, can have two different meanings. One is conditional. If we had pie, we could have pie and ice cream, if we had ice cream. In that statement, if represents possibilities. It's a conditional if. It expresses possibilities in that particular case, tasty possibilities, but just possibilities, right? If we had pie. If we had ice cream. The other sense of the word if describes a past completed action that has present consequences. If you are going to be here this morning, you might as well listen to what I have to say, right? That doesn't express possibilities. You are here. That if is really more of like since. Since you are here, let's make the best of it this morning. Get it? You say, 
Got it? We all say? Good. Awesome. The word if in verse 1 is of the second kind. It means since. Since you have already been raised with Christ. Since you've already been raised with Christ. The Apostle Paul is describing so much more than adopting a new philosophy. You have been raised to a new kind of life in Christ. He's describing a change that's already taken place in your life because of your choice to surrender the leadership of your life to Jesus Christ. You didn't simply become the citizen of some new country. You authorized a complete recombination of your DNA. You went from worm to butterfly. The metamorphosis that takes place when you surrender the leadership of your life to Christ is as profound as that which takes place when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Nobody ever mistakes a caterpillar for a butterfly. The change is profound. The caterpillar enters the cocoon. And while its biological essence continues in an unbroken stream, in some very real sense that we all intuitively understand, its spirit, if you will, dies to its old self. It becomes brand new. It dies to its caterpillarness. That's a word, you English teachers. I just made it up. It dies to its caterpillarness in order to embrace its butterflyness. Okay, two new words in the English language. Call Webster's and let them know. But make no mistake, the Apostle Paul is not speaking metaphorically here. He's not saying, man, it was so hot in Arizona, I was dying. He's not saying that. He's not saying that. What he is saying is that the people at the morgue are as dead as a doornail. And so are you. Were you? Not a metaphor. It's real life. It doesn't, we don't look dead. We don't look dead. The worm went in the cocoon and, and it's going to come out again. So our mind says, no, it's not dead. We really did die in our trespasses and sins. We really did die in our old life. When you surrendered the leadership of your life to Christ, you entered a spiritual cocoon. And in that moment, although your physical life continued in an unbroken stream, your spirit was transported back in time, 2,000 years, to a hill called Calvary. And there, on the cross, you were found in Christ so that when Christ died, you died with him. Your spirit died in that moment. And then three days later, when Christ rose from the dead, you rose with him. You emerged from the cocoon. Get it? Good. All right. This concept is key to spiritual maturity. It is key to spiritual maturity. By our choices to rebel against God before we, before we even heard about Jesus, maybe. By our choices to rebel against God and his authority and ignore his commands and do life on our own terms, we sold ourselves into slavery. Jesus calls the devil the prince of this world. He calls the devil the master of the human race. In the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam and Eve dominion. That's a Latin word. It means lordship, mastership, control, governorship. Gave it to Adam. He says, don't mess it up. Here's the tree. That one eat all you want. That one, don't eat. The devil came along and said, hey, it's not a bad tree. Look at it. Looks good, tasty, smells good. Check it out. And Adam and Eve rebelled against their creator and went under the authority of the devil. And when they did that, they took the dominion over this planet that God had given them and they handed it to the devil. He's now the master of this world. And if you don't know that, read the morning paper. He's the master of this world. 
Otherwise, intelligent people don't behave the way the people in this world behave. They're under control. They're under dominion. We sold ourselves into slavery, and we need to understand that truth. Paul says to the Roman church in Romans 6, 16, he says, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. A slave sold into slavery can only be freed in two ways. One, he can be freed by his master or by death. And the devil will never set you free. He will never set you free. So Jesus made a way out for you. And that way out is that you have the ability to die with Christ on the cross. So that you can be raised to a new life. Freed from your old master. That's what Jesus did for you. That's a blessing you can count on. And Paul tells us, therefore, and whenever you see a therefore, you need to ask what it's there for. Therefore, since, not if, since this is the case, seek the things that are above. Set your minds on things above. In other words, live your new life. Live your new life. How tragic would it be? How tragic would it be? If after going through the entire life cycle of a butterfly, the butterfly sat on the same plant it was born on and never flew away. How tragic would that be? You would not see these these forests with just trees covered every inch with monarch butterflies. You wouldn't see that. What you'd see is milkweed plants covered with butterflies. So much so that there's no more milkweed for the caterpillars to eat. So no more monarch butterflies. How tragic would it be? Having now the ability to taste thousands of exotic flowers, how tragic if the butterfly tried to eat the same plant it was born on. How tragic would that be? And it's not just missed opportunities. Check this out. Butterflies don't have teeth. They don't have teeth. They cannot now survive on what they used to live on. And neither can you. Neither can you. Having been given this new life, the butterfly would wither away and die if it didn't embrace being a butterfly. How tragic would it be if the butterfly never went on with its new life to reproduce itself and make the next generation of new butterflies? What if we saw the last generation of monarch butterflies? How tragic would that be? Paul tells the Colossians, don't be party to that tragedy. Don't be party to that tragedy. You are different now. You are not the people you used to be. You are better than that. The old way of life won't sustain you any longer. It won't nourish you any longer. Embrace your new life. Live your new life in Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. He then tells you how to do that because we're human beings and and we need to be led a little bit at a time. So he tells us how to do that. First, he says, and and this 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 is the Apostle Paul's words, destroy your old clothes. I know it doesn't sound like the Apostle Paul's words. It's the Apostle Paul's words. Destroy your old clothes. You're not that fat, old caterpillar you used to be. Your cocoon will no longer work for you. Those clothes don't fit anymore. And Sobel raises monarch butterflies. And, and, and you, the things that used to cover the butterfly, they don't work anymore. Do you ever see a monarch butterfly carrying around its cocoon just in case? Just in case. I, you know, don't, don't think I can get back in there, but just in case, I'm going to hang on to this, right? No, you don't need those things anymore. Guess what, people? Guess what, church? We do that. We carry around stuff from our old life, 
just in case. Do you know why we carry around those bad habits, those hang-ups? Do you know why we, those hurts? Do you know why we carry them around? Because we want to eat a piece of cake on Saturday. No, we carry them around because we are afraid of what our life will be like without them. We're afraid of what our life will be like without them. Don't be afraid. You're a butterfly. You don't need that anymore. You don't need that anymore. Jesus has everything you need. Those clothes don't fit you anymore. The things you used to use to cover yourself so that people would think you were good, bad, whatever, they won't fit your new life. You never see a butterfly doing that. Don't do it yourself. You don't need those things anymore. We keep them around, but they only slow us down. They drag us down. They tie us down. They make us down. They keep us down. They're only good for feeding worms, not majestic butterflies. And Paul lists some of them for us, just in case we don't know what he's talking about. Love the Apostle Paul. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. You, amen. You died and rose again. Put those things to death. Put those things to death. And the verb, the verb there is necrosate. Necro, if you're in the medical field, you know necro is death, right? It's death. And sate, it's the word we get satisfy from, We need to be satisfied with nothing short of death to those things in our past life. We're not into depravity management, right? That's not not what God calls us to. We're not into depravity management. We're not going to control those uh, evil acts and attitudes. We are going to kill them. They are to be completely destroyed, utterly destroyed. Paul uses the imperative tense here. You need to be urgent about this search and destroy mission. Here's the question we have to answer as human beings today. Are you going to be a butterfly or are you going to be a worm? Decide. And then plant your flag. Plant your flag. This is where I'm going to live. This is where I'm going to die. But wait, you say, Pastor Tony. If I'm truly a new creation in Christ, then why is there anything in me to kill off? Shouldn't Jesus have taken care of all of that already for me? It's a good question. Would be nice. Unfortunately, the answer is no. <laughs> That's not how it works. When the children of Israel entered the promised land, God said, I'm giving it to you. What did he say? I'm Is he what? Is he what? He's giving it, right? And then he turns around in the very next sentence and says, go and conquer it. Wait a minute. (laughs) Are you giving it or am I conquering it? The answer is yes. (laughs) Yes, that is exactly what happens. Because if you don't go in and conquer those things in your life, then you are going to succumb to the very first bandit that comes along. I'm giving it to you, but you got to go get it. I'm giving it to you, but you got to put it on. I'm giving it to you, but you got to make it happen. My strength, my power, my gift. But you got to do this because guess what? The temptation is not going away. If you don't know how to do battle against temptation, you are going to lose before you even get out of the starting blocks. That's what he's saying to us. God could flip the switch and make those things go go away, but the temptation is not going to go away. You need to be strengthened in the inner man, inner woman, 
in order to stand up to these things. You were raised with Christ. You were raised with Christ. And when that happened, you received a power you did not before possess. You can do this, but you have to do this. Right? Some of the biggest problems we had with our children is not the things we let them fail in, but the things we didn't let them fail in. The things we stepped in and fixed so they didn't have to. God is a better parent than we were in those cases. God wants to clean out your life, but he wants to do it together with you. Because he's raising up children who are going to inherit the family business. You are going to co-reign with Jesus Christ for eternity. You need to know how to do these things so that he can call you up and say, hey, handle that, will you? And you say, yes, sir, and you do it. That's what he's raising. That's what he's creating. This is management training for our kingdom roles. First thing on the list that Paul gives us are sexual. Sexual immorality, it's translated pornea. In case you're wondering, is it really sexual? Yeah, it really is, pornea. You know, it's a word we get, pornography. Graphy means right, porno means what you write that's porno. Uh, <laughs> it's a general Greek word for every kind of inappropriate sexual activity. It includes adultery, extramarital sex, fornication, premarital sex, even just visual images. It's all included under this one term. The next word is impurity. It includes not just what we're doing with our hands and our eyes and our feet, but it's what happens in our heads, right? It's the things we think about, our ideas, and the words we use to express them. It's our thought life, our jokes. To these, Paul adds passions and evil desires or lust. Paul mentions covetousness and says it's a form of idolatry. It's a sin with a wide range. The word really has got a wide range. It's, if it's the desire for money, it leads to theft. If it's the desire for prestige, it leads to evil ambition. If it's the desire for power, it leads to sadistic tyranny. It leads to invading countries that are not yours. It leads to those kinds of things, right? If it's the desire for a person, it leads to sexual sin. Such desire, says Paul, is idolatry. Why? Because any time we substitute anything for God, that's idolatry. And we substitute all kinds of things for God, don't we, in this world? It was because of these things Jesus had to die. How can we, having been saved by his death, continue to crucify him by our continuation in these behaviors? God loves you just the way you are. Therefore, the church needs to be a place where you can be open about who you are, where you can come as you are, where you can be open about who you are and not be condemned. But God loves you too much to leave you as you are. So the church also has to be a place where you can learn about him, learn about yourself, and grow to spiritual maturity. It's, we cannot accept and condone what Jesus intends to transform, right? Right? We can embrace, we can welcome, but we can't accept in ourselves especially what Jesus wants to transform. So I want you to, here's a question I want you to ask yourself today before you leave. What is in my life that needs to die? What's in my life that needs to die? And I want you to be specific. I want you to ask God and his Holy Spirit to reveal them to you. And then one by one, I want you to pray, Lord Jesus, thank you for showing me what keeps me from the victorious life you desire for me. I surrender these things to you. I join you on the cross and I die to these things. I receive the power that raised you from the dead to be different. Thank you for living your life in me. I give you complete control. Make me the kind of person you want me to be. There's no magic word. But you pray, if that's the desire of your heart, you pray that about these things the Holy Spirit brings to you, and he will transform you. You cannot win this battle in your own strength. God must win it for you, but you must claim the victory. 
But, that's not, but it's not just about taking off our old clothes, right? It's not just about dying as a worm. Paul challenged you to dress for success. He calls you to put on your new clothes. In verses 12 to 17, he says this, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, Holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Jesus raised you to a new life. Live like that transformation has taken place. If that were true, How would you live? Live like that. The Greek word translated put on has specific application to clothing, (laughs) believe it or not. Uh, Literally, Paul's saying clothe yourself. Clothe yourself. Now, he gives you the clothes, but you have to put them on. The word translated as is like that other if, right? It it, it implies a completed event. Um, It's more like because than like. In other words, it's not dress up like something you're not, like a Halloween costume. It's because you are already God's chosen ones, dress the part. That's what he's saying. Because you're already this, dress the part. The word translated chosen, it's a great word. It literally means chosen out from among. Imagine the perspective of a beggarly orphan child in an orphanage. The king comes and looks over the crowd, a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand screaming kids, and his eyes lock with joy. And you know, he smiles, and you know he has selected you. He has selected you to be adopted into his family. That's what this word chosen is. So literally it reads, because you have already been selected out from the screaming sea of humanity to become a child of the king and heir of the kingdom, clothe yourself like a prince or a princess. Put on the right clothes. And Paul describes what princely clothing looks like. Look at this list. What a great list. Compassion. Kindness. Think about your spouse. Humility, meekness, power under control. Think about your vocational life. Patience, think about your driving habits. I know, now I'm getting personal. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. Think about your family. Loving, the peace of Christ ruling in your hearts. Think about the last stressful situation you experienced. Thankfulness. Think about your prayer life. And this is just a partial list. It may be that as I was reading through it, the Holy Spirit was bringing other character issues to your mind. Put those on as well. And let me encourage you before you leave here today, ask yourself this question. What do I need to put on? in order to embrace the new role that God has chosen me to play. Specific. Ask the Holy Spirit, reveal it to me. What do I have? We get so focused on the sins we commit, we forget about the sins we omit. There's things we're supposed to be doing. It's not just things we're not supposed to be doing. There's things we're supposed to be doing. For Jesus to reveal them to you today. Then tell him, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for providing my clothes for me. 
Thank you for showing me how to dress as your child, as the child of the king. I accept these new clothes from your hand. I join you at the tomb. Raise me up to this new life in you. Thank you for living that life in me. Thank you. I give you complete control to make me the person you want me to be. And again, the words of that prayer are not as important as the attitude of your heart. You express that in any words you want. Spend some time this week working this out. You can't just come here for an hour on Sunday morning and walk out a changed person. You literally need to climb into your cocoon with your Bible, with your prayer notebook, and soak in the Spirit. Wrestle with that action plan on the back of the outline. On your app as well. But wrestle through the questions on that action plan. You cannot dress yourself. God has to do it for you. But you must walk in those characteristics once more. And even though God gives you the clothes, you have to wear them. You have to wear them. And that can be pretty difficult in this world that we live in. Humility, patience, meekness, those are not character attributes that are celebrated in this world. They're celebrated in hell. And you don't do it in your own power. You do it in his And he gives you four ways to unleash that very quickly here at the end. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. What's the Say it with me. Richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you what? Richly. Let me ask you this morning, does the word of Christ dwell in you richly or poorly? Don't answer out loud. (laughs) Okay? I think for many Christians, the word of Christ dwells in us poorly. Right? He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, richly, overflowing, abundantly. You cannot be the man or woman of God you want to be without the word of God dwelling in your life richly. Second, singing spiritual songs, worshiping God. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you watch. Be careful what you sing to on the radio. There's some great songs out there with some great melody lines and some great harmonies and some some great, you know, boogie beats, right? Some horrible words. Okay? Sylvia and I were listening to some kids singing something from the radio, and she turned to me and she just said, do they know what they're saying? Or do their parents know what they're saying? I think no. But those words... our character. Worship God. And then whatever you find yourself doing, get in the habit of saying, Jesus, this is for you. I'll tell you what, you want to stop sinning, that's the one who'll do it. <laughs> right? It's very difficult when you're enjoying one of your old habits to say, Jesus, this is for you. <laughs> right? How do you guys know what I was doing? (laughs) You just gave yourself away. Right? I mean, whatever you do in word or in deed, say, Jesus, this is for you. When you're in your car by yourself on the freeway having a full-blown conversation with the driver in front of you, say, Jesus, this is for you. And you know, it will help you shape your right? Personally, I think the speed limit should be 145 miles an hour because that's as fast as my car will go, and I know that. It should scare you. And Jesus, this is for you. Amen, right? I, and so I, 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 need, I need to force myself to drive 65 miles an hour when Sylvia's behind me. Fifty-five when she's with me, or the kids are with me. Yeah, it's not good when the grandkids are in my car, and she knows what I'm doing. Um, right? I mean, but but by saying, "Okay, Jesus, I'm doing this for you," and it doesn't drive me quite as batty. 
And finally, be thankful. Be thankful. We live in a world where we're always so tuned into the things that we think we lack, we forget to be thankful and count the blessings that are present in our lives. So let's go to prayer. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to bring conviction of those things that he wants to change in us. And let's commit ourselves to actually living this new life that God has for us. And let's just pray that he will show us how to. Well, Lord, let's just pray. Father, I just pray that by your Holy Spirit right now, you would bring conviction into our lives. Lord, there's things that need to change. We're not perfect. And when we come into the presence of a holy God, if we aren't feeling some of the brokenness, some of the, the, the compromise, some of the issues that separate us from you, if we're not feeling those, we're not paying attention. So right now, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring those into our conscious minds. Help us not just to feel them, but to cognitively Apprehend them, understand them, see them in our lives. And Lord, not just our sins of commission, but Lord, also bring to our mind our sins of omission, the things that we ought to be doing that we're not doing as we ought to. Lord, there should be a profound difference between butterflies and caterpillars in this world, and you have called us to be butterflies. You have made us to be butterflies. Help us to live that changed life. Empower us, Lord. Help us to take off those clothes that don't fit anymore, and help us to put on those new clothes, humility and patience and meekness and forgiveness and loving kindness. Help us to dress as children of the living God. And Lord, help us. Help us to make the time and the commitment that the word of God may dwell in us, not poorly, but richly, abundantly, overflowing. Lord, help us to be thankful. Help us to be thankful. Help us to see all of the ways you bless us and love us protect us and provide for us. It's too easy to see the ways that we're in want. Help us to see also the abundance that is ours in you. We ask these things for your kingdom.